Once upon a time, a passport was just an identity document. Apparently, the Romans were some of the first to use coins to identify themselves and distinguish themselves from those who were enslaved, while a number of other fascinating examples of passports existed in ancient times. In Japan, for example, there were these beautiful ornate scrolls. Before colonialism, West African tribes had passport masks, which were decorated in a way that identified their tribe, facilitating trade and different alliances. That just sounds so much cooler than this little piece of paper. But it was actually during the French Revolution that passports first emerged as a tool to control freedom of movement, at first deployed by the Ancien Regime to ensure that peasants would not come into the cities. As a columnist who went by the name Le Puchet wrote in The Moniteur Universel, to allow a man to travel is to allow him to do something that no one has the right to deny. It is a social injustice. That was the first time it became a political issue. It was not until 1882 that the government decided to see if immigration restrictions could be used to discriminate against an entire nationality through the Chinese Exclusion Act. Still, even though Chinese immigrants were technically not allowed to go to the United States, those wishing to come to the United States simply went to Mexico and walked across the border, then an open frontier. And come to think of it, this might have been the first example of quote quote, illegal immigration which just goes to show that immigration is only legal if crossing a border is criminalized. Welcome to What's Left, a weekly political discussion challenging the mainstream left. I'm Eduardo Walker, co-host, teacher and socialist Sandy Lipson, and uh, socialist Kenny Cepeda. We are online at whatsleftpodcast.com. That is what's left podcast.com. You can find that link to our site in the episode notes. Uh, you can also find our personal social media handles as at Don Eduardo Barca on Instagram and Jesse Sturdo handle, our other co-host who's not here today. Her handle as at jhomie89. Uh, please subscribe, rate, view, turn on your notifications and share your favorite episode wherever you found this episode. Thank you. All right. Uh, today's topic, let's see. Today, we are joined uh, by writer and journalist Anna Lee Kissmiller. Uh, Anna covers the social effects of foreign and national security policies. Anna has reported from numerous countries in the Middle East, covering issues such as the Israeli occupation, the Syrian civil war and exodus to Europe, and the rise and fall of the Islamic State. Uh, most recently, Anna has been investigating immigration systems and sharing the voices of people resisting them. And as the author of Love Across Borders, Passports, Papers, and Romance in a Divided World, Anna shares with us the most heartbreaking yet inspiring stories of love and healing, literally, <laughs> across borders in a world that has favored a few and divided the rest of us. And with humor and historical context, Love Across Borders uh, made Jezebel's list of top 11 books to read this summer. And Anna continues to share stories of immigration through her online presence and videos. You can find her as at, Le at Anna Likas Miller on Instagram where Anna does lives every week or so, and on X, formerly known as Twitter. And uh, you can also find, um, uh, you can also follow Anna's newsletter on her Substack, which we will link to all those handles and her website in the episode notes. Welcome, Anna. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I guess we'll start off with how I came about the whole thing. I think that's a good place to start. And then we'll start asking you questions. So I <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for your book. Uh, it made me laugh. It made me cry. It made me, there's a lot of things I felt. And uh, and uh, I just, it was really important at a time when I was coming back. I've just come back from Colombia from this summer. And I, I remember arriving uh, on Friday. I was supposed to go to a commemoration and then after I, I arrived at the, the wrong date because I confused the dates. So I thought it was supposed to be on the day I arrived, but it was supposed to be the following day. So I was I went to the library right afterwards perusing. And I saw this book at the SFPL, San Francisco Public Library, right there, just on the shelf. And so I, you know, I come back from Colombia. This is the second time I've been to South America. And I have lots of stories for friends who are from Venezuela and people I've helped and I just was like, I need to read that book. <laughs> the cover and everything, I just grabbed it. 
And there were so many stories of love, coincidentally, that I had discussed with people. You know, people leave for so many reasons, economic reasons, for conflict, for dangerous reasons. But this time around in Colombia, my conversations were centered around love, romantic love, family love, you know, friendship love, people torn. And I'll do my very best not to be crying in this episode, but there's so many stories that you shared that was so touching, that were so touching, that was similar to the stories that I've heard in Colombia. And as you know, like there's millions of Venezuelans that are pouring into Colombia and, uh, and, you know, talk about people here in the USA saying, oh, we can't have a lot, but Colombia is such a small country and it's received so many migrants from Venice, from Venezuela. Anyhow, so that's how that came about. And I thought I should just, I just thought, oh my God, I don't want to write to this person because I'm so embarrassed. I'm so, I'm a nobody. So I just wrote you an Instagram message and then you were like, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. So they said, write to me on my email. And then I did. <laughs> oh my gosh, that makes That's sense. That's how this came about. I think we both might cry on this episode because even just hearing things like that, because it's just, I mean, I want everyone to read this book and stuff, but it's like, especially just knowing that it's reaching people like you that have yeah. such a similar story to me, but at the same time in a totally different context. And I feel like, when I was living so much of what I went through in this book, I was sort of thinking, because I'm a journalist, because my brain even processes my own life in this way, I was like, well, there, you know, borders are fucked up. So there have to be other versions of like, there has to be some, you know, Mexican American version of me that's having this whole like complex, there has to be someone like me in, you know, South America, all these types of things. And, um, and I didn't have, you know, I had a tool as a journalist where I was able to reach out to so many of these people and gather the stories for this book, but sort of knowing that there are people and, and that gave me so much strength to know I wasn't alone. Like that was massively healing for me. And so, but then knowing that there's people who, you know, they're, they're being a nurse, they're doing other things for society, right? They don't necessarily have a job to connect to people the way it's my job, or even your job to be connecting to people the way that we are. And so just knowing that I made something that's making that happen is it really is. all the feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for validating that. Yeah. That cool. and, you, and you know, here on what's left, like the four of us are very strong open border folk. And we are really, this issue has come up on our podcast so many times. You know, Andy Lipson, who is right there, he longtime Marxist advocating for open borders from the very start of even starting this podcast we had this discussion and very staunch supporter and works in the mission district worked for many years in the mission district with so many people from latin america and you know you have kenny who is from guatemala and he can each one can share their own reasons why this is such an important and our other co-host who isn't from who isn't here but she was born in england and she has also had dif differences in in the way that she was separated from her family and just trying to also make sense of what it's like to be uh, a white woman from England and where most people would think that immigration is mostly targeting, you know, or, or mostly affects people of color. Right. And uh, and then myself having two nationalities, having I can vote in two countries. I have two citizenships, but I know that my story is not the same story as many of the working class folk here in Mexico that are from Mexico because that you know, middle class, rich Mexicans stay in our country, but the poor folk come here. But just knowing those differences and why some some privileges, so to speak, are granted to others and others are not simply because of where you're from, where you were born, the time, the place. My parents were given amnesty in the '80s by Reagan. It's like, you know, you don't, you don't. It's it's just it's just it's it's just very dependent on so many factors right so many acts of chance and acts of luck and stuff too like nothing's even happened like that amnesty deal since the 80s as well and it's just like where would people be if we had one of those now like people could have these privileges that shouldn't even be privileges because they should be rights and all these types of things and it's it's um it's obviously very hard to live without those and it's also difficult to live with those and just be like I didn't deserve this i didn't earn this this was dumb luck yeah yeah i don't know if any of my other co-hosts want to say anything can or andy before we continue i mean i i, I just want to share that you know this book it's magnificent because it touches me personally for the, the my own experience immigration experience 
dealing with deportations in my family, dealing with separation and all this stuff, but also the stuff that I care about that I haven't experienced myself, but, you know, these areas of occupation, war, displacement, and the damage, you know, that that creates. And, and so I love this book, you know, definitely recommend it to, you know, everyone who's listening. Um, it, because I, I think often in the, when it comes to immigration here, I've been part of the, um, you know, pro-immigrant community, uh, organizing, doing stuff here in San Francisco or in the Bay Area. And often we forget that this is not unique, like you mentioned. This is happening in different contexts, you know, for for a lot, a lot of the same, same reasons, to be honest. And, and, and we need to be aware of that, that this is not a, 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 a southern U.S. border thing. You know, this is happening in Europe. This is happening in parts of Asia. This is happening, you know, in many places and and we need to ask why and we need to realize that people these are real stories right and this is what i love about your book that these are real stories real lives with real consequences and not everyone is just a victim there is people who you know thrive and survive despite these adversities and at the same time you know shouldn't be like that and we'll get into all this but just wanted to say that thank you for the book God, thank you so much for saying all that, Kenny. It just makes me really happy. And it's really meaningful to, you know, be on a podcast with other people that are working in the Bay Area, but also, of course, seeing this in a global context. And just, you know, when you were talking, it made me think about when I was reporting the book and I, you know, digging into, you know, some of the histories I knew better than others and being like, OK, all of these histories have to do with like racism, colonialism, white supremacy. I'm like, maybe at some point I'll like get to dig into a history that doesn't deal with these things. It's like, nope, all of them come back to like racism, colonialism, white supremacy, no matter if it's our southern border in the United States or here in the United Kingdom with the legacy of the Windrush or, you know, Europe and Africa, all of it, all of it just comes back to these like toxic things that are kind of governing our world in this awful way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for me, um, I didn't really, Eduardo had called me about two weeks ago or three weeks ago saying, Andy, I I think I want to do a topic on love on the border. And he didn't even tell me there was a book about that. Um, And I was like, that's really interesting. Like, I hadn't really thought about it. I I often get caught up in this question of border in terms of jobs, economy, Mm -hmm. empire, you know, countries destroyed by U.S. empire or Western empires, and then they create immigration issues. I get caught up in just that language of of thinking of this issue. And um, for him to bring this up, and really, really, ultimately for you to bring this up to all of us through your book, to say, I feel like the most important thing when talking about open borders is to remember this is founded in humanity. Like, Mm -hmm. and that's what I feel like. So folks, if you you think this is just going to be a feel-good episode to talk about human stories partly yes but the the ways you write about it in in terms of looking into the history of passports and and things like that expose what the real what the real aim and how unhuman what has been put in place is and it it really when i when i was falling in love with brandy i lived in san francisco and she lived in oakland and in order for us to actually get married, I had to cross a bridge and live over in Oakland. And it really made me think, what if that What if that was a border there? What if that was a boundary? One could say, and when I moved to Oakland, I took somebody's job. I, I mean, ultimately, I got a job in Oakland. I took somebody's place to live. And yet I'm free to do that because, well, for something very arbitrary, because a border is there is a border that separates Oakland and California. I mean, Oakland and San Francisco on a map. You can see that, but it's just not on it does, the state doesn't declare it a border at this point, at least in time. But it, it just seemed very arbitrary to me that the a state could impose and could interfere in me and somebody else being able to actually have a relationship. Because if it if it did, then I don't know if me and Brandy are together. And I be I feel like this that this this subject actually reminds me that this is what this is about, is about controlling people. And if not, if not for that arbitrary, quote, freedom, my life would be completely different. Um, and so I, I just really appreciate the fact that you took this framework. Um, and I'm looking forward to having this discussion today about it.
Oh, well, thank you so much for bringing up that example. Actually, one of the really brilliant people, one of the brilliant scholars and lawyers I look to, his name is Stephen Slade, I believe. Um, you know, one of the things he says is he uses the U.S. as an example, just being like, OK, there's all these places in the United States. Like, what if I get a job as someone that lives in, say, Pennsylvania? I get a job in Ohio. Like, I can just go. I can just move. I just take that job. No one's making this big fuss over like, oh, you took this job over this person that's in the state or something like that. And, um, you know, that's that's what open borders globally could look like is it's just like and it actually is something that's not even something very leftist, but something actually that the, you know, the more conservative people like talk about all the time in terms of meritocracy, like, why isn't it the best person for the job if you're really going to be like having a level playing field? And that's something I love to bring up just to turn things on its head. And, um, and just getting back to the idea of humanity in the book, I think one of the things that I'm so grateful for for my editor who worked on this book. Her name's Madeline Jones. She's a fantastic editor. And she was so clear from the start that this actually shouldn't be that political of a book. And any time that I tried to like, you know, go too hard on like Republicans or something like that, she cut it out. She was like, I want everyone to read this book and I want everyone to know this is about families and I don't want anyone getting caught up in the politics of like, he said, she said, left, right, whatever, like, let's center this on people. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think as, as a person who's been moving more in circles now, when we we're in the medical freedom movement, things like that, but the word freedom, hmm. like if you are concerned about freedom, you are concerned about borders. So hmm. anyone who's concerned about freedom in society should be concerned about the imposition of borders. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. And the freedom. And I really agree with your editor about taking that approach. Yeah. She was, <laughs> I mean, I'm so lucky that someone like her was sort of like, you know, keeping me in line, so to speak. I know. Why don't, why don't we uh, uh, get to know you? I, I think like when I read about you online, I most like I seen the intercept. I've seen a few things that you've written. You know, you are a writer, you're a journalist, you reported from the Middle East. You, I said, like, you've covered Iraq, you've, Israeli occupation, you've been in conflict zones. Like, I, you're like obviously, you're a seasoned and brave journalist. I, I just want to know about Anna as someone who grew up a child in the USA. Where was your upbringing? What, tell us about your, yourself. Uh, absolutely. I grew up in the USA. I grew up, you know, in the Bay Area, actually. Um, <laughs> And I, yeah, I grew up, you know, in a very like American family, I would say in terms of, you know, I'm Lebanese American, my mom's side of the family is Lebanese, and we were, you know, proud of our cultural heritage and very much representing that and everything. But that was, um, you know, that, but that was a part of me as much as being American was a part of me. And, um, you know, like I, like I, I have a distinct memory of like, we had like, you know, when we have like heritage days in like school in the U S and stuff. And I was like the only one, you know, had heritage from the middle East in my class. And I remember there was another girl, she was like Jewish American or something. And her, we had this map. So hers went to like Israel and mine went to Lebanon. And I was like, Oh, I was like, you know, I didn't know these two countries were at war at that time. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. We're so close on the map. And like everyone else, like from Europe and shit. And um, (laughs) it was just a really funny moment of like my own like naivete, which I think still follows me to this. You know, I'm now like a seasoned conflict reporter, but I'm still like, they could be in love. Um, So, (laughs) so, yeah, (laughs) and you know, I kind of had this, you know, cultural background, but still, I think in an extremely American kind of way. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that was really pivotal for me was sort of 9-11 happening when I was in middle school. Like, I'm kind of that age of like aging millennial at this point. And um, and that's the moment where I felt like I really went maybe from being like someone that would have of been a white person for all intents and purposes to being a brown person like it was something that kind of flipped and it was like I think a lot of Arab and Muslim Americans my age sort of had this experience of like middle school bullying combined with like this massive terrorist attack that happened which like I you know conceptualize it quite comedically at this point in my life because I think that combination of things it's really dark but it's weirdly funny to me but um I don't know why it's like I'm saying it now I'm like no actually that's fucked up but um but there is 
lots of dark humor that comes out of it. I mean, um, and so much of the way that I now connect to my husband, who is from the Middle East. And, you know, I just, yeah, I remember, though, like, sort of being in, uh, being really young, being in middle school, being, say, you know, I was 11 when 9-11 happened. I was, you know, 12, 13 when, you know, the U.S. invaded Iraq and just being like, oh, my God, like, my country is also invading and bombing this part of the world where, like, you know, my family is from, where people that look like me are from. And I did, you know, even at that age, I felt this, like, conflicting sort of, um, these conflicting type of feelings. And, like, we were having discussions of them in school, obviously in, like, a middle school kind of a way and stuff. But, you know, I had I had a history teacher. She was kind of, you know, aging hippie vibes and stuff. So she wanted to be talking about how this was, like, very unjust and everything and was sort of staging debates to talk about it. And um, yeah, I have a distinct memory that I wrote about in the book where I was the only person on the side of the classroom that was against invading Iraq. And I was just like, well, this shouldn't be too hard to convince people that like, you know, a bomb is probably going to kill civilians. And this is like, these are people that are no different than any of us in this classroom and stuff. And I was stunned that like no one was on my side with that and um yeah it was it was you know and one thing that I don't share in the book but is quite fun um is the fact that you know at at that time you know my now husband Salem who I of course write about extensively in the book because that's my love story he's Syrian but he grew up in Iraq and um he was living through the U.S. invasion of Iraq as a civilian at that point. So it was, and he, you know, even at one point he was arrested by the Americans. And so it was really strange that at this moment in, in history and in, you know, the history of our relationship, I was this, you know, child <laughs> that was trying to get the U.S. to stop bombing Iraq. And then, um, you know, my husband was a teenager who was living the consequences of this war as civilian. So that is one thing that really sits with me as well mm. yeah well i mean you've talked about your husband why mm -hmm. did you write this book could tell us <laughs> segue into that <laughs> oh my gosh of course but so yeah you are the author of this book so now like did, why did you decide to write it <laughs> oh my gosh so many reasons um so basically um my husband is a wonderful person named salem he's syrian he's also a fantastic journalist and um, I met him when I was in the Middle East. I, at the time I was living in Beirut, Lebanon, I wanted to go back to kind of where my roots were um, and, you know, was curious about that. But then, of course, was traveling around. I took a trip to Istanbul. I did not know anyone. I did not know anyone, which is so funny now because it's like the city where it's like the most people that I know. <laughs> um, and, when it, you know, I just did one of these things that journalists tend to do where you just connect with your your people, you know, and you're just like, who should I meet? Who should I meet when I'm in town? And, you know, Salem was one of the people that I apparently should meet. And um, yeah, I remember very vividly, he called me on Facebook Messenger. And I don't think that anyone uses Facebook Messenger to call me literally besides Salem and now my mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> I, I was just like, is this thing ringing? Like, what is going on? <laughs> And then, yeah, and like we, I don't know, it felt really like I'd known him for a long time when we talked for the first time. And, um, and he was giving me advice about some reporting trips I was going to do. And then he was like, yeah, yeah, let's like meet up in Istanbul or whatever. And, um, we just, you know, we just clicked so much. We actually ended up meeting for the first time on my 25th birthday, which is great because now that's the anniversary that we celebrate. We both have no idea what day we actually got married, but we just celebrate on my <laughs> birthday because this is just like two birds, one stone. Okay. <laughs> and, um, it was a great, great birthday present. And, um, and yeah, I mean, what, one of the things I think is so funny about our relationship is, you know, he's this journalist. He has such like a background in sort of covering you know, um, these Islamic movements in the Middle East, he has so much insight, so much, you know, incredible knowledge. And people are always like, they're like, oh, is it so hard for you to be an American girl with like some guy from the Middle East? And I'm just like, we're like so cut from the same cloth, this whole like clash of civilizations kind of bullshit. It's just like literally never come up with us. And I mean, part of that is because like, 
I'm Arab American. He grew up with like lots of Western culture where, you know, in a way we're actually kind of the same culture just because of how we like combine those things. And also we're just, we just got along as people. So then um, because of how much we clicked, what really did strike me about what was so different about us was the fact that I held a U.S. passport and he held a Syrian passport as being someone from the Middle East. And the way that affected the way that we moved through the world and the way we could sort of live out our hopes and dreams as journalists. I mean, I always wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to be covering stories. And like, that was possible for me because I had this passport where I could kind of like turn up to a place and work for at least a couple months and stuff. And that was just, you know, tremendously difficult for him. When I met him, he didn't even have a passport at that point. And, um, and I just, you know, I just really was hit with that when, um, you know, you know, even in the beginning of our relationship, it was very much, we lived in Istanbul and it was, you know, and I write about this in the book It is this felt like a magical city where it was a place where like, I could fall in love with him, where no one really cared that I was American. He was Syrian because we were both allowed to be in the same place. We could explore who we were without those things, you know, binding us. And then, um, of course, the Turkish government is not known for being kind to either refugees or journalists. Salim was both. He was kicked out and um, we moved to Iraq. You know, he was he was deported back to Iraq literally just because he was on a reporting trip there. He was just sent back the way he came. Like it was no he had no ties to that country. It wasn't even a place he'd lived like he'd lived in Baghdad. He was sent back to Erbil, totally different city. Um, And it just struck me at that point that the way I could follow him was because I had this stupid American passport that just let me move through the world with like all of this freedom and all of this privilege. And if, let's say, my family had never left Lebanon, let's say I had been Syrian or any of these things and I'd fallen in love with the same person because I am the same person and we would have fallen in love regardless of the passports that we had, would we have been able to be together? And that really, like, haunted me. And I wanted to find people who didn't necessarily have that privilege and that luck and see how they did it. Yeah. It's so funny how those, those, like my Mexican passports are like number 20 something of the strongest passports. The US American passport is at number nine, I think it is. It's just differences in what people can have access to. Did you want to say something? Go, or Anna, go ahead, sorry. Oh, yeah. And it's just like you're the same person whether you're presenting the Mexican passport or the US passport. Like, Yeah. And I, like Eduardo, you know, he sent you a list of questions, long ones sometimes. Um, and then he asked me to be like, well, Andy, would you have any questions today? And I was like, I, would, I probably did. But the question that's coming to mind for me right now, and we will either edit this or not, is like I'm thinking about me and Brandy having celebrated our sixth year meeting, not the not our wedding, but on September 18th was when we met. And so we just in 2016. And I'm just curious what. What would how would you what would you describe as foundational between you and how do you pronounce Salem? Salem. Salem. Yeah. Salem. Um, what do you feel is foundational in your relationship that makes has made you so close and has made you, uh, you know, like you would never be with any other person? I'm just kind of curious because those are the sorts of things me and Brandy talked about just this last week. Oh well, first of all, happy anniversary! Thank I you. love a September anniversary. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we love that. Um, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is we had this shared sort of sense of adventure and, you know, desire to understand the world that made us really connect. I mean, that was refreshing for me as a woman because I felt like I felt like I dated people maybe in the past who liked the idea of dating a journalist and then someone who just, you know, went off on assignment was suddenly not so attractive and fun. So when Salem just really accepted me for who I was in that sense and I accepted him, it just felt like we really, you know, connected on this um, 
on a level that was really about what we felt like our purpose in the world was and that we were able to fuel and support each other in this really beautiful and magical way that I don't think you just find, you know, when you're just like, oh, yes, you know, I mean, and dating apps and people meet each other on dating apps are great and everything, but it's just like, oh, these are my career goals. And like, I want to have a nice house with two kids and whatever. Like Salam and I was just sort of this like manic, here's all these like places I want to see and these stories I want to cover and these like things that interest me and these things I'm really obsessed with. And, um, you know, it's just having these things that are weird about you celebrated as opposed to tolerated that I think is really that I see as very foundational in so many love stories where you know sometimes you're just like okay that's kind of cute and weird if it's like your friend and then if you're really in love with someone it's just like that's the greatest thing I've ever encountered in a person so I feel like it's a lot of that I'm I'm curious as to um how long did it take you to write this book and uh, what part of your relationship with you know your husband uh did you write the book and you know, how did you navigate that? Um, you know, because you share a lot of private stuff and, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, he was enormously supportive from like day one. He was really excited about the book and sort of saw it as, you know, the minute I told him the idea, he was just like, oh, yeah, that's like a book that needs to be written. And actually, my first idea with the book was going to be just the vignettes of different people's stories. I had this sort of idea of myself as a journalist, like I'm a fly on the wall. My story doesn't necessarily matter. It does allow me to connect to people in a way that I wouldn't if I hadn't been through this. But um, I didn't necessarily see writing my story as particularly valuable. And um, my I was really lucky that my agent helped me sort of undo that and help me get more comfortable with the idea of writing it and I wrote a story about us for CNN um, kind of when the Muslim ban got extended and that story went completely viral and I got so many people reaching out to me telling me that they were in a similar situation with their partners and it really helped both me and Salem see that our story had a lot of power um, to share it. So I think um, we were both kind of on board with the fact that like, this was a way that we could get other people to understand maybe people that wouldn't, they wouldn't otherwise relate to and things. So, so yeah, he was, um, you know, because he was working through the same things as a journalist, too. And now actually, you know, one of his biggest regrets is he has this um, incredible film that he uh, directed that's called Syrian Rebels Advance with Vice and um, it's actually the film that got him nominated for a Rory Peck Award which is the whole way he got a visa to the UK and um, it's an amazing film that uh, he films inside of his hometown of Jisha Shukud in Syria and but the thing that the film doesn't show that he wishes he had shown is that during that assignment he actually evacuated his family as well um to southern turkey and now he wishes that he told that story as part of it but at the time he was just a guy trying to evacuate his family so um so yeah it's it's a it's definitely scary to be putting ourselves out there like that i mean i was terrified the week the book came out because i was just i don't know you're so used to like the internet being a cruel place but um it's been a really beautiful reception. I mean, it's just been getting to connect to people, you know, getting so many messages like the one that Eduardo sent me just, you know, sometimes multiple times a week and uh, knowing that there's other people out there that are experiencing this and then are maybe even able to connect with each other as a result of like talking more about this is just incredibly like my wildest dreams at this point. So, and if you think, how did you? choose all of these stories like how is specifically you know because i was thinking about kenny's question and it's like how long it took you and and then also these stories how did you come about them how did you choose some of them were very for me like the the woman from the stateless without <laughs> karina i think it was mm -hmm. cecilia's story and from being separated having kids um i mean those like really touched me because you have kids and families involved you know at some and many of them, it's like I think of the families I have worked with in the mission district. And then there was a story, I forget their names right now, but of the two, uh, the, the gay couple that were in detention in ICE. 
that one also moved me a lot. Um, but how, so how did you, did you um, choose or come about these stories? Yeah, I mean, oh, I realized I didn't answer Kenny's question fully about how long it took me. It took me. <laughs> <laughs> so I I it's so it's it started marinating I think like pretty soon after Salem got deported and like I started living this myself but at that point of course I had no idea where our story was going to go or anything like that I just knew I cared about seeing the way that love stories were affected by borders and that's when I started looking for the story so I started just thinking about where I'd encountered them and it was, I was just literally constantly on the lookout for stories. And, but like when I met people, like I just like knew in my heart because of how much they connected to the ideas of the book and how excited they were that someone wanted to talk about this and stuff. Cause I think a lot of people have a version of these stories, but they don't, you know, they didn't necessarily see what the value was in telling it. And so when people really saw the value in the storytelling and, um, you know, we were able to build a connection and trust in that way. And a lot of it, you know, some of them were, you know, people I interviewed maybe once or twice and, but often people I built relationships with kind of over a couple of years as well. And even if it was kind of like maybe one or two interviews that formed the bulk of what's in the book, it was, the kind of relationship where I could go back and be like, oh, you know, this memory that you remember, can you tell me more about that and stuff like that? And, um, and it was, I was so surprised. I mean, you brought up Cecilia, who's just one of the most beautiful, inspiring humans I've ever met in my life. And um, I remember when I met her and I had the same feeling of just being like, wow, this woman is a mother of five kids and has been through this and has, you know, not only survive this with her family and with her husband, but is just like out here helping her community and even being a national advocate for families like hers. And um, I was just like, oh, what I've been through is stupid in comparison and stuff. And she really immediately saw me like she was just like, oh, oh, so you get it. Oh, so you've been through this too. <laughs> and, you know, we just connected as friends at that point. Um, and I don't know. I, I felt really honored, you know, not that anyone should have to go through anything like this, but I felt really honored that I don't I just see her as sort of this, um, like someone I look up to so much. So to even be like on her level, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like that's cool. So, um, you know, I wish I wish we were able to bond about something else rather than like our racist government and the way it's affected our husbands. But, um, you know, next life. And, uh, yeah, but it was, it was really, it, it was really spiritual. Like it was, you know, when I met people who they were just so aligned, like it felt like kind of cosmic at points, honestly, like it, I, I, I honestly haven't felt something like that ever before in my life. So it was a really special experience of just, um, gathering, like really gathering and putting this together as just sort of this beautiful bouquet of like incredible people just a quick follow-up question you know obviously you're a journalist you're an author of this book and was there a difference you know uh, as to being a journalist versus this which is very personal yeah it's it's a really good question because it's like a lot of people think oh journalist author you do the same thing um, it was so different. I mean, if I if I when I was like a reporter in Iraq, for example, I was just um, writing what I saw, not putting I not putting anything, you know, anything that I maybe wanted to say, I would find someone else to say it through a quote. And yeah, I did a lot of that. Like there's the foundation of the book is reporting. And I think I think I'm always going to be a reporter in how I write, you know, even like now I'm trying to even think about writing fiction. And even that I feel like I'm a reporter when I'm doing it, because it's just things I've observed through the world and even wanting to fictionalize. Um, but having to interrogate myself, having to kind of dig into my own feelings to go through personal journals that I'd written to think about how I was feeling at certain moments in my life to think about when there were moments of tension in my own relationship with Salem when um you know even just yeah and recreating that as an emotional experience for someone else was it, it was not writing a normal piece where it's easy 
I think you can kind of disassociate when you're a journalist. And I see a lot of journalists disassociating. And it's actually, you know, I think it's why there's a lot of, you know, PTSD and stuff in our community is because people get through the rigor of the job through just cutting them off from their own feelings. And writing in this way, whether it was my own story, or even getting to know people well enough that their story kind of became a part of me while I was writing it. And while I was trying to put myself in their shoes, it was, you know, it was the opposite of disassociating. And I'm grateful for that, because I'm grateful that I'm not one of these journalists that disassociates anymore. I'm immensely grateful to the process of writing this book that it like, reconnected me after I had been through something that was traumatizing in ways. And, um, you know, it was just, it was all the feelings in every single way. I mean, I remember one time I was like revising Muhammad and Amel's chapter for maybe the hundredth time and Salem just turns to me and I'm just like sobbing at my desk. He's like, are you okay? Did something happen? I'm just like, but they were childhood sweethearts and like childhood sweethearts are real. And he's like, okay, she's crying about people in the book again. (laughs) um, So it was, it was a lot of stuff like that, but it's that, that never happened in my journalistic career in that way. (laughs) I think we should talk about why people are divided. And I think that comes to Andy's question, you know, like we need to figure this stuff out and the history. Andy, can you follow along, follow up? Yeah, Eduardo, I want to get to this passport stuff. Can I? Is that yeah, that's the, that's the, that that was to the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will just say that, like as Eduardo said, we on the show have been advocates for open borders since the start of the show uh, four or five years ago. Um, I don't think our audience is actually for open borders, but we are, and I think people really struggle with that. And I want to start with something that I did not have much knowledge of. And I'd like you to talk with more, like talk to our audience, talk to anyone about what you've learned about passports in general. And I want to start with this quote from your book, which I love. Um, It said this, um, French revolutionaries were the first to protest the way that passport controls were being used to control freedom of movement. Quote, to allow a man to travel is to allow them to do something that no one has the right to deny. It is a social injustice. A commentator went, a commentator who went by the pen name Pouchet, I guess, uh, wrote in 1790 in a widely circulated La Moniteur Universelle. That's in French. I don't know how to say it. Um, Going on to argue that passports were a form of slavery, characterizing the French ancient regime as um, slave masters exerting control over the lower classes. Um, Let's see. Then he said, but when King Louis the 14th fled the country, the National Assembly sealed the border to prevent other members of the monarchy from absconding. Um, so for me, that was like a great quote to just talk about just the basics of passports. So I guess like I'd like to just give you the forum to talk about what either what you've learned about passports or what would you say about passports that show that these things have always been about control and slavery. And I don't know, speak whatever you want, because there was a lot of things about passports in your book. Yeah, um, well, I'm so glad that resonated with you. Learning about passports resonated with me too. And I think it's a very, it's both an enraging and a very healing experience for anyone that's been affected by, you know, this injustice and the way that they divide people. And just knowing that the world hasn't always been this way um, gives you hope. It gives you hope to be like, okay, if a hundred years ago, it necessarily wasn't this way, like, Who's to say we can't open up more instead of closing down more? And, you know, I think a lot about, you know, we you, we talk, especially as the United States, as a nation of immigrants, talking about people who, you know, maybe came on steamships maybe four or five generations ago. They weren't dealing with borders the way that we are today. It was it was quite easy. Like if you could afford the ticket, you know, if you could afford passage, you could come to America, you could start a new life. There weren't um these things that were imposing um restrictions i mean the same with our southern border where it was land that you could cross over it's many indigenous communities are from both sides of what is now the border and you know the border is an arbitrary line in the sand or the rio grande river or whatever you want to call it and it's very much formed and fortified with 
these kinds of laws that then are, you know, protecting one country um, from people coming from another. So, you know, in what I thought was powerful about the French Revolution example is, of course, it was all French people, but it was based on class. So it was based on just wanting to protect the city people from having the poor peasants coming in who were against the regime. And now that sort of class framework is imposed on, let's say, the global south to keep them from coming into the global north. So it really is, if you think about this sort of like the fortified city walls of, say, you know, medieval Paris or something like that, you can kind of think about that as being around the global north, which is seen as powerful and prosperous and, you know, wanting to keep other people out. And what's so ironic about all of that is, of course, the way that, the, you know, so many places in the global north, you know, thinking about Europe, but also, of course, the United States in a different but related way, even the reason why they are powerful and prosperous is based on exploiting the resources of so many places in the global south, both historically and to this day. So, um, you know, the way you have wealth concentrated, it wasn't that way. It wasn't some kind of entitlement. It hasn't always been that way. It's based on exploitation. So you're really just having people that, um, you know, for themselves just want an option in their lives um, migrating. And then also, you know, a question of what would redistribution look like? You know, whether you're talking about that in the context of the United States being based on built on slavery, or you're talking about Europe being very much built on colonialism. And um, one of the things that comes up in conversations with, uh, you know, Europeans often about um, open borders is being like, oh, well, like who's who would take advantage of the welfare state? Like who, how would that be governed? And it's just like the entire welfare state exists because of colonialism, like because of resource extraction based on colonialism. So if you're saying that, you know, only European nationals should be entitled to this, like you really have to check yourself. Um, and I think these things are just incredibly important to think about. Um, you know, the history is incredibly useful to think about when we're looking at the present day, when we're looking at so many people, you know, as Eduardo mentioned, so many of his friends even migrating through the Darien Red Gap right now who are coming through Central America, who are, um, you know, hoping to reach the United States. And of course, the hostility that they're met with once they're there. When you're thinking about, you know, Europe and when you're thinking about people who are still dying in the Mediterranean, even though that's barely being reported on at all anymore, because it's so absolutely criminally commonplace. So, um, you know, understanding these histories, understanding that things haven't always been that way. Um, I would love to see more of that in conversations going forward about open borders and Something that it's going to sound a little bit out of left field, but I invite people to think about when considering open borders is, you know, in my lifetime and all of our lifetimes, I think we've seen marijuana decriminalization really change. And, um, you know, that becomes something that's really, really different and probably, you know, affecting people's lives for the better. And, I think about that in terms of open borders a lot being like, okay, if, you know, this used to be something that was illegal and now you can buy it from the shop and like people aren't necessarily being criminalized in the same way, you know, why, why can't this be something that people are thinking about and working towards and advocating towards too? And another thing that comes to mind with all of that as well is, the fact that I think a lot of people, when they read this book or when they hear me talk, they're just like, oh, my God, you're this crazy lady that's really into open borders, which is 100 percent true. But um, I think that there's a huge, you know, we think about it's all it's this, you know, so many things in life are thought of as binaries that need to be thought of as scales and spectrums. And open borders is one of them. You know, we have over here where we are now, we have total free for all over here. There's so much room in between those two things where things could be more open, lives could be massively changed, families that need to be together could be together, 
people could have jobs and opportunities and, you know, the resources they need to just support their families and live in dignity. And, you know, why aren't we just thinking about those gradual steps? Why do we get caught up in this whole like, oh, total free for all would never work when we could be thinking, how do we make people's lives better through opening up a little bit at a time? So it's it's about these open borders. You know, I'm going to start with, hopefully I can deliver my thoughts because I talked to you a lot about it a little bit because I feel that every election cycle in the U.S., the issue of immigration comes up. And, you know, the narrative gets manipulated. We put people up into going to vote for something, you know, whatever. Um, what I've noticed, at least in the U.S., is that the liberal left, like, by and large, it is starting to be bombarded by this narrative that we have to manage the border, mm-hmm. right? Like that, the, the, okay, like we we care about these people, but we have to have an orderly process, right? So the, there is this. The, we're not moving towards open borders. We're moving to again reinforcing that you know this like, notion, ludicrous notion that we can you know, have a sort of humane control of a border, you know, and and so I guess my question becomes, you know, your thoughts on this and also were you always open borders? Like how did you what was what was your personal journey towards, you know, this this point? Um thanks for asking that question. I think I mean, one of the things, too, it goes back to this idea where it's like these things can be thought of as a spectrum and not a binary. It's just one of the things I think about in terms of just practicalities is there's so much backlog. There's so many jobs that should be filled in terms of, you know, processing asylum cases. Let's say, you know, why not have why not have our resources be going towards just, you know, filling out the system so that people can be processed in a timely manner so that you don't have people like Oscar and Darwin who are detained for months on end in this inhumane way where you don't have what's happening with, you know, people even after that, you know, their story, which, you know, happened in say like 2019 when, you know, you had the remain in Mexico policy, you had title 42, you had all these things that were actually keeping people in Mexico to keep them outside of the United States that was then, you know, subjecting them to kidnappings and all of the types of things that people flee from there. So um, I think that, you know, on the one hand, I'm just like, you know, yes, people should be able to just cross, but like also, you know, let's say, let's say you want to have a national boundary there. Let's say you want to have something there to distinguish, you know, what is American, what is Mexican, just for the sake of argument. Um, why not just make it like a lot easier for people to cross? Why not just sort of make that process faster? I I do believe, you know, I do think that there's like merit in screening and part of the irony of not having open borders is then you have, you know, unauthorized immigration where really just anyone can come. And you, where you really, you know, the example I like to pull about that is more in Europe with people coming from the Middle East, because what started happening was you had war criminals who supported Assad, you had ISIS fighters who were coming as refugees. I mean, I get that this is a far right narrative, but it was happening. So then you had like Yazidi women who had been raped by kidnapped and raped and sold as sex slaves by ISIS in Iraq, who got asylum in Germany, who then saw their attacker with their eyes on the streets of the city where they're supposed to be safe. And if you had some kind of a screening process in place that was like quick and efficient and worked so that people could actually use it, you know, you would think with all of the technology and surveillance in the world that like, maybe you could like, figure out who is ISIS. Um, I would like to think that's something, you know, that's something that could be done. So that's actually, you know, it's funny, because the argument, how, how can I even say this, like, the argument against open or the argument for open borders is actually kind of you know flipping it on its head because it's it's just you know it's because we don't have open borders 
we're actually making people more unsafe in this kind of a way that I think needs to be talked about. And I think is actually a powerful case in favor of maybe not something that's open borders by definition, but would certainly be a much more fair and just and equitable immigration policy. Um, And then in terms of like, my own personal, have I always been open borders? You know, I think honestly, as an American passport holder, we sort of, if you haven't been exposed to people who live differently than you, to people who move through the world differently than you, you sort of think that there are open borders because you can travel to these places. You have those privileges, you have those rights. And until you start really, you know, unless you're born in an immigrant family and maybe you have family members like this, or unless you start, you know, hanging out with people who do, who are exactly the same as you, but don't move through the world the way that you do, you're not exposed to this at all. And um, so, you know, I don't think politically, I, I think politically, I would have always wanted the idea of a board, but I thought the world was a lot more open than it was because I was born with those privileges. And then the minute I realized that this was an accident of birth for me and that it's really unfair for the global majority, I was like, fuck this. So, you know, I it was by accident in a way. Hmm. Andy, you were going to ask. Uh, yeah. And the part I'll read another quote because in many ways, I'm not a favor of the League of Nations or the UN, like it's a council of dividing the world and things like that. But I do think this quote you had um, from 1920s about a debate that was taking place at what they, the, the Paris Peace Conference, I think it was really illuminating for me. I'll read it first. Um, still, this is the, from the book. Still, there was a moment that might have turned the tide in terms of uh, immigration and the idea of potential open borders. After the Paris Peace Conference, the newly formed League of Nations organized a meeting in 1920 to determine the future of the passport. Passport controls had proliferated around the world during the war, but many policymakers were still in favor of abolishing borders, their words, not mine, and met to discuss whether it might be possible to ease travel restrictions and restore freedom of movement, no documents required. It is, and you say, it is surreal to imagine a meeting with the future of freedom of movement hanging in the balance. It is even stranger to imagine a room full of decision makers debating the merits of open borders as a way to pave the way forward for lasting peace. And I don't necessarily believe that they were like, I don't think that you was trying to do that. But what I liked about that was that that's re- I, to me, that's the case for open borders. If you want a world of peace, then you have to then talk about allowing people to move anywhere you want, because if you don't, the state that divides is going to use it as a divide to make war. <laughs> and it, it, I, for those of us who consider ourselves revolutionaries, as much as it seems so far away, and I'm, at this point, I'm not sure how it happens. I don't see any way towards that future world except through literally no questions asked open borders and those borders have to go away. I don't. Like, and, and it's interesting to me that in 1920, people might have conceived of that very same thing and said, how do we get to a world of peace? Their way to get there was to get to consider um, opening all borders. And I agree with that. Now, of course, I'm sure they sh- they can that stuff and they shut it down because the U.N. is, a, is in my opinion, a, a institution of war. But um, nevertheless, I felt that was fascinating that they that they realized that the only way towards a world of peace is to open these borders up and to let people move freely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's like. And I think it's useful to think about and I think it's useful to take the politics out of it and just be like, yeah, this was not a super radical lefty thing. This was literally talking about economics. This is talking about people being together. This is talking about trade. This is talking about, you know, the ease of travel and goods and everything. And I mean, I think, you know, some of the things people talk about now as well is talking about how it's so easy for capital to move through the world. It's so, you know, without borders freely. And, um, you know, there's so much technology, there's so much um, free flowing when it comes to making the rich richer. And, um, and yet we haven't, you know, it's not that we haven't figured out how to like, let people do that too. It's that um, we don't want to. And I think that really needs to be talked about because there's just, 
you know, we, the fact that we live in a modern world with, so, you know, the fact that we have these technologies that we couldn't imagine having technology to be able to do something. And yet, uh, you know, up until he had a UK refugee travel document, my husband could not get on a plane to go most places. Actually, he still can't. Um, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, I, I think you've covered a lot already, even with some of the questions I already asked. You know, there, there was the two vessels that were missing. You know about this. Uh, there was the the vessel that where wealthy folk were in. It, it was um, what was it called? I, I'm looking. I'm trying to find it here. Yes, the Adriana vessel, right? And there was like cover to cover uh, coverage over it. And then, no, the, the, yeah, the Diana vessel, I'm sorry, was the 700 passenger ones. I'm sorry about that. Then there was the other vessel uh, that was also lost at sea. And there was clear disparities in the way, in this contrast, in the way that this, they were covered. And here you have 700 passengers plus, right, from that, that were refugees. And then you have, what, what were they were five and two billionaires in this one vessel, and during this time, this summer, <laughs> and I just was amazed at how much coverage was given to these, the, the to these five people, because they're billionaires or millionaires. Like, what does that say about our society and how, you know, people value one life over the other? If you're rich and wealthy, and in our, you know, lives ruled by the elite and the wealthy class. I mean, yeah, I think this story said it all in terms of what's valued, because even for me as a journalist, I'm out here just trying to um, write stories about refugees all the time. And the amount of times that my stories have been rejected because it's just like, yeah, there's refugees from Syria. What else is new and stuff is, you know, enormous. Like it's just the media appetite for these things. Um has gone down so much. And then, you know, you have this story of another vessel that's lost at sea, um, where it was people that volunteered to be on this vessel. It's, um, you know, it, it, and sure, it was a story that deserved coverage and stuff, but not at the expense of, you know, why people have to take these like absolutely dangerous journeys. And, you know, the other thing I noticed in, um, the coverage as well, you know, besides just the pure disparity of, you know, cover to cover coverage compared to like almost nothing is the framing and the narrative around it where it's these billionaires that paid a lot of money and elected to be on this vessel were seen as, you know, these brave explorers going where no man had ever gone before. And it's, you know, so interesting. And they're such like incredible people. And then, of course, the way refugees are discussed is that, um, you know, they're migrants, they're leeches on the system, they're criminal, they're crossing illegally, they're, um, you know, they're framed in this way that they are just, you know, no names at best and sort of worthless almost at worst. And when actually they're incredibly brave to be taking these dangerous journeys, they're incredibly brave to even imagine a future for themselves that's not being in their country that's not staying at home they're incredibly brave to be you know seeing a world with open borders when they really do not live a life where they get to have a life of open borders and I wish that um you know not only just the dignity that any human deserves but also that those qualities of just enormous, you know, bravery and imagination were emphasized in these stories because um, those are the people that I meet when I have the privilege of, you know, reporting on refugee stories. And I wish that that was sort of the conversation because that's what's true. Uh you know, it was uh, the vessel Titan, by the way. I just wanted to be clear. <laughs> the vessel Titan and the Adriana was for the 700 passengers. I don't want to get them confused and for our listening and uh, viewing audience. 
Uh, and I have another question. If some if someone wants to come in, they can ask as we're wrapping up. You know, in 2015 and in 2016, I was working and living in Europe. I left and I and uh, you know I've been to Europe as an adolescent because my mother had been between two countries. Um, I was here in California and in Mexico from like just for my schooling and then I go back for half a year at home and that was my experience and then I went back to then then after that my mother married a second time and because of our uh, um, our economic situation we would just spend our summers in Europe and th that was the extent of it so I went back in 2015 I stayed out there very different from how I was when I was an adolescent to 2015, with the UN named the year of the refugee crisis in 2015. It was the conversation everywhere, whether I was on a cab in London and being asked where I was from. And as soon as I said Mexican, it's like, oh, okay, then all of a sudden the hatred and the, sp the spewing over refugees was being said. Uh, whether I was in France and I was staying in a host with a host family and at uh, who I love dearly, but I was staying with them and they would say things like, you know, what will happen if all of the refugees come, we'll lose the French. That was literally what they were saying. You know, we won't, we'll lose the French way, we'll lose the French people. And I was, this is in a small town called Mouchon. And a lot of people were saying these things. And, and I remember being in Wales and I had that picture of that two-year-old that circulated the world. Island Kurdi, is that? Yeah. yeah. And it, the photograph was just stunning and everybody was talking about it at the time. And I want to post it here, so I'll have it edited in here. And there were difficult conversations being had. I was the only Mexican person working in the music festival scene. So everyone was Irish, Scottish, British, everyone. And they were saying things that they felt comfortable saying around me that they wouldn't say around other Arab uh, Brits. And it made me uncomfortable, you know? And so I, I just know from my U.S. American experience to my European experience, I want to know what that contrast is like for you out there, you know, because you are both. You're U.S. American and you're Lebanese American. You're Lebanese American, right? So I just, I know that here it's about Latinos coming from the south to the north, there it's about northern Africans, Middle Eastern, and other uh, people from the global south that are different different demographics, right? Mm -hmm. So, what's it like out there for you? Uh, you know, I mean, it is one of these things that's so interesting, and I feel like our communities too, even as like Arab Americans and Latin, especially Mexican Americans, you know, growing up in California and stuff, like you know we have so much similarity in our cultures and stuff too, that I think there's a really natural solidarity between us. I've definitely felt that. Um, and, you know, and I feel like you feel that too, when you're here and you're like, okay, you're talking about these people that are migrating. Like these are the way my people are perceived in the United States. Like what the hell's going on? Um, I think you know, it's so funny in the United States, we often, you know, especially on the left, we often very much, uh, you know, place Europe on this kind of pedestal as this, you know, wonderful place that has these like social programs and it's so great and everything. And, you know, I'll tell you right now, I mean, like Salem and I are trying long term to move um, back to the United States. Some of that is family reasons for myself and just, you know, that being like a home for me and a place and, you know, we it's just not feasible for us to be in the Middle East anymore. Um, but like a lot of that is because the United States is a place that like for all of its imperfections, for all of its total fuck not fucked upness, which I do not want to, you know, downplay. It is a place that's accustomed to diversity. It is a place that um, I feel like I could have a child who would, you know, understand and have a robust sense of their identity in a way that I'm not sure that I could have a Middle Eastern rooted child in Europe that would have that same feeling. Um, and that, you know, they would grow up in a diverse country where that was just something that was, um, you know, maybe not always celebrated the way I love seeing it celebrated, but at least just kind of accept it as life. And um, I, you know, there is like, yeah, there is just like a level of kind of 
racism and Islamophobia that is um, both within European communities and even, you know, at this point within European governments um, that is, you know, it not only creates, uh, you know, kind of a awful racist environment, but also it's it's structural racism at this point too. I mean, there's just actual straight up hiring discrimination. I mean, you do see examples of um, people going back to the Middle East because of the racism in Europe. And I mean, you can say like, oh, they're so entitled or something like that. But, um, you know, you, you really kind of get it and stuff. I mean, Salim and I have uh, you know, I mean, he's one of Salem's friends. I've met him like once, but um, he's Iraqi and uh did the whole super dangerous trip to get to Finland, and got to Finland, and um, he went back to Iraq, and then and then he tried to migrate to Europe again and did that again, which is we were just like, and then we were like, wait, you got to Finland? Why would you go back to Iraq? Why would you do that and everything? I mean, I was used to living in London, which is incredibly diverse. I don't feel you know I just feel like part of the city here and so everything and then I had experiences you know going to northern Europe where even my like very white passing brown girl appearance was like I felt weird <laughs> and I was just like oh I get why the Arabs feel weird here like this is really uncomfortable and I was just like oh my god if I feel this way what does someone with like you know my husband's beard feel like what is and um I mean, I'm rambling at this point, but a place I really actually felt it is Berlin. Um, you know, and I think it's an interesting example because it's this city where people are like, it's freedom. You can be whoever you right. want. Oh. <laughs> and it's like Berlin is an incredible city. I, mean, I had an incredible time there. But like, um, you know, I have so many Syrian friends at this point who've ended up in Germany. Like, that's always my community when I'm there in Berlin is a city I go to a lot because of them. and. Um, you know, so I'm very often the people I'm hanging out with it or there are Arab men. And I um feel so on edge just walking around the streets. Like I feel like I have to be constantly prepared in case something fucked up happens. And um and it's like, you know, I remember even, you know, going out one time. We were celebrating my friend's birthday. And I was I was shooting this shit with my friend in Arabic. I was making some joke. Who knows what I was saying? It was like three in the morning. But, um, you know, and then my German friend who he was well-meaning, he was trying to watch out for me. But he was just like, oh, I would not speak Arabic here if I were you. And I was just like, what is this place of freedom if I can't make a joke in the language that I joke with my friend in? And I just, you know, I just invite people to kind of understand that side of Europe a little bit more. You know, not saying that like, lots of European cultures are amazing and lots of Europeans are very aware of this and there's so much activism and movement against that but I just think especially as Americans we're sort of like oh my god like America is so fucked up but like Europe it's amazing and it's just it's there's a shadow side there's a big 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 shadow side that I think um in many ways is actually more progressive imperfect yes but progressive in the United States Hmm. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think we should try to find a way just one question from this is from Luis Miguel Moreno Diaz who's Venezuelan and I told him I was doing this interview today and he said I just want because I was sharing with him this book and I don't actually know if this book is also in Spanish is, is it? Too? Not yet we're working on translation okay. Spanish is like my number one priority of course okay, I want to good. Well, but like Spanish I'm just like please 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 please, please. so yeah yeah well I've been sharing For stories sure. and stuff and uh and so Luis asked he said can you ask one question I said oh, okay well let's see if I can because you know <laughs> and he said uh I'd like to know he said I'd like to know what you think are the basis to maintain a long distance relationship with someone or from either her experience or from the stories that she has heard and how would how would one put it into practice or can you give an example of how to maintain a long distance relationship Gosh, well, hi louise um thank you for your question <laughs> <laughs> um oh long distance relationship i mean it's so cliche but of course communication is just absolutely everything and um you know being um being in touch and just being able to 
create the feeling of intimacy that you miss, you know, however that works for you and your partner, you know, maybe it's FaceTimes, maybe it's sort of just being there for special moments, maybe it's sort of messaging throughout the day, everyone is really different. But I think just, you know, communication is key. But you know, communication doesn't necessarily mean just messaging it you know also I think has to mean like an emotional honesty about like today's a really tough day I really miss you or today's a really tough day I'm going through this it you know doesn't have to just be like oh here's my breakfast you know have that depth of communication have that um be willing to be vulnerable with one another even if um you're not in the same place and not able to do that together and um and I think um keeping keeping hope keeping some hope that you will find a way to be together I think part of that is some of that is strategic and everyone's really different I think for me I was always like strategizing what me and Salem's options were and stuff but I think also having this like idealistic kind of a hope is um a really amazing survival mechanism as well when you are like I don't know how this is going to happen but I have faith that um we can find a way to be together I mean I think I think of people in the book who sometimes they you know they their stories had happy endings where they were able to be in the same place um and sometimes their stories didn't necessarily end in the same place, but they're still together. And, you know, they still have that love together, even if they are living separated from one another. So I do think that there are ways that love can truly transcend borders. Um, And, you know, I, you know, there was a time when I didn't, I couldn't imagine that I would be living in the UK with my husband and our cat in a very boring and domestic married life kind of a way that has like absolutely no excitement like you read about in the book like I told my dad yesterday I was like I literally have nothing to tell you I am so boring right now (laughs) um and that's such an enormous privilege and it's not something I take for granted And um, there was a time when I just thought my life was going to be chaos constantly. And, um, you know, and I I hope that people can hear that and think that um, maybe that will be the same for them as well. And, you know, and also I think uh, all love is beautiful and love doesn't necessarily have to mean forever as well. Sometimes there are relationships that have to end. And I think it's important that those relationships aren't seen as failed relationships, just because it's not necessarily happily ever after or all this stuff Mm. that we're kind of raised to believe. But even if you learned and grew together, that's still something to be celebrated. Well said. Oh my goodness, there's a lot, there's a lot that we could still <laughs> unpack here. Uh, Andy or Kenny, as we... No, say. I was so, I was so wanting to jump in on some of the other stuff. about. Like, I know. The Hitler quote and the eugenics right. quote and um, the show, the roots of eugenicism and border controls and things like that. Because uh, again, people on the right, they want to control borders, but a lot of these people who want to control borders, they were eugenicists. And I know you people don't like eugenicists, so that's what they're doing. But anyway, I actually think, um, Anna, you ended on the better, the best note, which is about love. <laughs> um, and, and in all honesty, my relationship with Brandy would not have happened if there wasn't a person before her who I did fall in love with, but that had to end. And mm-hmm. out of that came my ability to find a partner that was right for me. So I really, I, I completely believe that there's not a failed relationship if you grow and learn from it um, and love can come. And in many ways, I still love that person, even if we're not together um, because of what it meant for me. So I really think I appreciate your 33 year old wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> can you or... No, just thank you for sharing. And uh, again, this book is amazing. I really hope we can maybe talk again because there's so many more things i want to ask you and like 
<laughs> and also talk to your husband. You know, like I would like to. I'm sure there's a lot there, and like maybe in the future we can contact you. You know, or him. And be fun. I would love to do a podcast with him sometimes. He's really funny and has a lot to say about politics. So I think it would be a very interesting interview. For sure. And so thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your enthusiasm and the interview. It's been a beautiful experience. You didn't curse that much at all. Was that? She didn't curse that much at all. You didn't like. Oh, wow. (laughs) It's my speak as a 33 year old coming into my, like, I don't know, grounded self era. (laughs) Anna, I'm the one attempting to police these two from cursing. And here you are, my, my guest. (laughs) <laughs> cursing up a wahoo <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding you're allowed to do it as much as you want I think by the way i was like can i curse because i curse yeah, a lot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no no i'm kidding um and you actually have a tattoo right it, can you tell yeah. us about your tattoo what's it what does it say all right here <laughs> um so it says guess out of hadood which means breaking borders. I think it's kind of like a nice way to say fuck borders in Arabic. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Salem and I, he, it's his, he has one as well. And we got it on kind of around the time that I got my immigration to the UK approved. So what was symbolic for me about that was it was about five years into our relationship. And this was really the first time in our relationship where we had equal rights. And the fact that we had gotten to a point where, you know, At first, it very much felt like I had more rights than him. And then, you know, when we came to the UK, there was a moment where he had more rights than me. And so that really showed us how arbitrary all of this is. (laughs) And um, and then, you know, when we sort of really felt like equals the way we always should be, um, you know, we wanted to celebrate that. We wanted to mark that occasion and stuff. And, you know, part of that was done through marriage. So I think of, you know, I wear a wedding ring, but I think of this as much more my wedding ring than, you know, the the wedding ring that I wear is, you know, this is the symbol of my commitment and this person's um, role in my life. Mm, thank you. Shame that. Well, we'll stay, stay with us a little bit as we conclude here. Um, uh, so we're just going to finish up with uh, how people can find your book. <laughs> Did Kenny have something to say? I just one more thing. I just wanted to share, you know, this quote and like that, you know, came up in the, in, I was listening to the book. I have a newborn and a baby. And so listening to the book is a lot easier. Um, but I, I guess people will have to read the book to find it. But this like paradigm, I guess, uh, stability without community or community without stability. And I just want to say, you know, that that just resonated with me. And like, I hope, we are we are looking for both, right? Stability and community, because we cannot be happy without community. And you know, so I just hope that you know you have that, you have found that you and your husband, because you know I know you've gone through a lot, and you know can only imagine. And so, because that's what I'm looking for. That's what a lot of people are looking for, and that's why people move around, right? And and so, just wanted to bring that up because I think it's a beautiful, you know way of thinking about life, you know, stability without community or community without stability, but we need both. Mm. Thank you. I, I love that that quote resonated with you because it's one of the things that, um, you know, happened while I read, while I wrote this book was, um, while I wrote this book was the period of my life where Bell Hooks's book, All About Love, came into my life. And I got to read that book while I was writing this book, which is an enormous mm. gift. And if anyone listening to this hasn't, please read it because um it's what expand you know when I started writing this book I was very I was so obsessed with romantic love I was such a romantic I was like oh my god me and Sal and all <laughs> oh yeah you know and and then I was just like oh my god this is about friendship and family and community and all of these things as well and it really expanded the way that I saw love and that I saw the importance of love and that I saw um the importance of support and just all the ways that people can and should be there for another one another and caring for one another and all of these things and the way the borders get in the way of all of that. And so, you know, that that book is, um, you know, we have bell hooks to thank for why this isn't just a book about romantic love, why this is also has stories about friendship, stories about family and stories about community that really weave their way 
through all of the stories. So I just, you know, rest in power, Bell Hooks. Um, I really thank her for expanding that vision because it made it a much better book in my book. Thank you. I feel like I'm I'm your agent trying to block people's questions. And here I am <laughs> like, okay, I, let's get her to sleep. She has other interviews to do. <laughs> so I'm so sorry. For everyone making, I'm not trying to be the bad guy here, but I, I am trying to get Anna to get before, don't, don't, don't apologize for the thing. <laughs> I'm like, okay, enough questions. Can you any? That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't think I don't want you here. You're always welcome back. You can always be here. You can always email us. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much we can unpack, like Andy said. Um, so, <laughs> all right. So here we go. Um, well, that does it for this week's episode. Uh, uh, Anna Likas Miller, uh, uh, book uh, Love Across Borders, Passports, Papers, and Romance in a Divided World. Uh, Anna, you continue to live, uplift. Well, you're not just doing it. You're not just having a boring life. You continue to uplift voices as you share. You continue to share stories of immigration through your online presence and videos. And fo folks can find her at Anna Likas Miller. Uh, on Instagram, uh, where she does lives every week. Uh, and she, you can also find her on X, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, you can also follow Anna's newsletter on her Substack. We will link all those handles on her website and the newsletter in the episode notes uh, so you can find all the information. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Hang on with us a little bit. Uh, What's Left is a weekly political podcast slash channel challenging the mainstream left. We post information about our topics and our guests on the episode notes wherever you found this episode or on our blog at whatsleftpodcast.com. Again, that is whatsleftpodcast.com. You can find past episodes to this podcast last channel there and connect with us. I mind fucks if you like anything you have heard here, please subscribe to our, please subscribe, rate, review, turn on your notifications to any of our platforms on Spotify, iTunes podcast, Google, Google Play, BitChute, Odyssey, YouTube, Rumble, or Telegram. I feel like I have marbles in my mouth. You can find our blog and any of those links in the episode notes where you found this episode. And if you'd like to give us feedback about something you've heard or suggest something for us to cover, contact us through our blog. Thank you so much, Anna, for being here. We really appreciate you. Like I said, you can always come back. Uh, so thank you so much. I'm Eduardo Varca, co-host Kenny and Andy, and we'll have Jess again soon in the next episode, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>